it's my pleasure to introduce you to David Spinks. We are on day three of the Giants Conference. Um, so we've got one more day after this. It's been a bunch of events so far. They've been a lot of fun. And it is my pleasure to have you here, David. Welcome. Thanks so much. Always, always a blast to chat with you, Joel. Yeah, yeah. So for those of you who don't know, uh, David's uh, VP of Community at Bevy, which is an enterprise-grade platform for building global customer communities. Uh, he's also the founder of CMX, which is like the community for community professionals. Uh, they run courses, conferences, and a whole bunch more, all with the aim of helping community professionals to thrive and to kind of build their own careers. Um, I met you back in 2016, David, so uh, <laughs> just while there's polls running, um, I didn't know anything about community when I first met you, but I had a job that had the word community in it. <laughs> so uh, I did your courses and, you know, I got involved in the CMX community and basically learned a whole bunch from that. And so, you know, before we get going, I just want to thank you, first of all, for everything you've done for community professionals the world over. Well, that, that means a lot. I appreciate that. And you've been our, our star community member for many years as well have always been an amazing member of the community. So super grateful for you and all the work you're doing. Um, you're, you've always been a good example of how to do community the right way as well. So appreciate oh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we've got this poll running. Do you already run a community? And 26% of people so far have said yes, and 73% are saying no. So I think we'll, we'll probably do, we've got a bunch of questions that will help both ends of the spectrum, but we'll probably try and guide things a little bit more towards people who might just be starting out uh, building community. So I'll end that poll now for us. Uh, a reminder, everyone, if you have questions, uh, we have a Slido up and running, which you might have seen. Uh, we'll post a link to that in the chat. So throw your questions up there. You can also upvote questions. I'm also keeping an eye on the chat inside our webinar. So you can throw some questions up there and I'll, we'll try and get to them too. Uh, so, um, first question for you, David. Let's see, where are we? Um, uh, so, Winston Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. Now, everyone's been knocked sideways by COVID. Uh, what I kind of want to know is if there's any way, like, us community builders or people who are looking to start community uh, can try and make the most of this unprecedented time that we're going through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, first off, it's a little weird to think about opportunity in a time when a lot of people are struggling. And so, um, you know, I, I guess first off is like, do what you and, and your com existing community, your employees, your teams need to do first before you start thinking about like, oh, how do we capitalize on this global pandemic? Um, I think a lot of it's going to happen organically and do the and and be the things that you just see people need and you just start solving those problems um and the the truth is right now one of the big problems people have is that they're socially isolated um and every single person on the planet is struggling with with the same overall challenge but it's impacting them in different ways um and if you're building a customer community there's a very good chance that all of your customers are experiencing this crisis in a similar way. Um, you know, they're, they're gonna have similar problems. If they're in sales, then losing all of their field marketing events has completely turned their world upside down. If your customers um, are in, in, <laughs> in, in restaurants, in anything that was in person, in music, uh, obviously, they're all going to have similar challenges. Everyone's working from home. Everyone's quarantining. Um, if you hear, my wife's in the background teaching a middle school class right now. So all my speaking events now, you know, <laughs> we're balancing doing this at home. Everyone, teachers are all doing it remotely now and trying to figure out how to teach their kids. So you already have a group of customers that you're serving. They're going to have very unique challenges right now. And that means they're going to be looking for each other and looking for places where they can talk to each other and and just say, like, how are you all dealing with this? How are you solving this problem right now? What are you doing? Um, and, and just having a space to be able to talk to each other is what people really need. And so the opportunity right now, if you don't already have a community, is to start building those spaces because the appetite for that conversation has never been higher. Um, if you already have a community, 
then then you actually we're seeing a lot of data that all online communities are growing a lot in growth in uh, traffic and, and posts right now. People are turning to virtual community in a massive way because we don't really have another option right now. And so all things considered, now is actually a really good time to be building community. Okay, so now, so uh, I guess the summary of that is that people are, you know, they're feeling isolated and they're feeling lonely. And, you know, one of the main things that community does is help to, you know, people feel connected to other people. Uh, so you're saying now's a good time to start community or to, you know, not necessarily build your own community, but just to get out there and to try and actually help people who are maybe a part of your business, they're your customers or your employees, and, you know, try and use community tools to address some of those issues. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, so when you talk about community, there's always kind of this dual value. There's the value of like, I just feel a sense of belonging as a part of this group. And so that's valuable to me. And so yeah, if I'm lonely, and you are providing a community, maybe I can solve part of that loneliness. Honestly, probably not that much because my loneliness probably stems from like my disconnection from family and friends and human interaction because we're all online. But uh, that all said, yes, you can find some good belonging and connection through these communities. But the value also comes from just the, the practical value that someone gets out of participating in your community and the way that people are contributing. And so, you know, a simple way to think about it is um, you're probably all trying to figure out how to build an audience, right, for your business. You're trying to build an audience that you can market to, sell to. So to build an audience, what do you do? You help people. Right? You create value, you create content, you do something to help them, and so they want to follow you and become part of your audience. So to, to build an audience, you help people. To build a community, you help people help each other. Mm -hmm. right? That's okay. a fundamental difference. And so by helping them help each other, now you're able to answer these questions that they have and provide this value and support them at a scale that you never would be able to if it's just you and your small team trying to support everybody. Mm, that's a great point, helping them to help each other. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Well, so next question. Um, for those of us that are used to doing that that work and, you know, used to trying to get people to help each other uh, and we're used to doing that in real life, like actually in, through in-person events or through, you know, whatever it is but in person, uh, what kind of advice do you have for those of us who are now, you know, you know having to figure out how to do this online? Yeah. Yeah, so everyone's moving online. Um, we don't have a choice right now. We have to completely shift our strategies to be online focused. Um, and so all of our events are now virtual events. Um, for CMX, we have 60 local chapters around the world. All of those local chapter leaders move their events to virtual. Um, Bevy, we power the community programs for Salesforce and Slack and Atlassian and Twitch, massive, massive communities with thousands of events, all of it's moving virtual. And so it's moving virtual, um, plan on it being virtual for a while. Um, conferences are not gonna happen this year. Everyone who rescheduled for the fall is, in my opinion, not gonna do it. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. 2020 is a wash for conferences. 2021 might be a wash for conferences too. If you really think about it, the last thing to come back is gonna be big events. Um, they're going to do smaller restaurants, smaller gatherings, spaces where you can still be socially distanced. Um, but big events with lots of people getting together and being in tight quarters, that's going to be the last thing to come back. And that's after we figure out vaccines and we understand more about the virus. And then you still need time to promote an in-person conference at hmm. least three months. Three months is radically fast. Usually we promote our event all year. So if we get to mid-2021 and then they start opening up to big conferences, we may still not see big conferences. So big conferences, kind of a wash. In person, smaller events may come back for the foreseeable future, move everything to virtual. And, and my advice is to just start doing it, start experimenting. You don't have to throw a massive conference. Um, you can start with just webinars if that's what you're comfortable with. You can start with a Zoom call with 10 people just getting together for a discussion group. There's no, there's no, too small to start a community, right? Two people can feel like they're part of a community. And so just start organizing and start bringing people together to have these conversations in any virtual format you can um, and let it grow organically from there. 
uh, and, and you'll start to see how your community can gather and be meaningful online. And I'm happy to dive into like virtual event tips and things like that, if that's useful sure. as well. Well, let, let's let's just touch on it quickly. So you you guys just ran, CMX just ran a big virtual event. Can yeah. you give an idea of like, what sort of time frame did you take to organize that? Um, you know, what sort of, you know, comparing obviously to online events because, uh, sorry, to in real life events because mm -hmm. CMX it does a big in-person conference every year. What's the yeah. time for to organize something like that? Yeah, so we did this event. We hosted it yesterday. We had 3,000 attendees, um, about 1,800 uh, checked in, showed up for the event. Um, and uh, we put it together in five weeks. Um, the team worked very hard to do that. We had about 40 speakers, I believe, um, multiple sponsors. I think we had 15 different sponsors that were demoing there. Um, networking, discussion groups. Uh, so we had a whole full event. It felt very much like an in-person event. Like you went in and you can go to the main stage, you can go to different sessions, you can join smaller discussion groups. We had speed networking. We had a DJ at the end. We had yoga in the middle. So we mixed in all these different kinds of experiences. Um, we put together in five weeks. I would say that's very accelerated and ambitious. Um, and I would like to have at least three months to do it properly because it's also just more fair to speakers who need to prepare um, to promote it properly, to get all your ducks in a row. Um, mm -hmm. I would say like three months is a good amount of time for a big event, um, but you can do it in as fast as five weeks for sure. Uh, and it was an incredible event. We've gotten such positive feedback already from the community. All right. And so what kind of uh, tips can you give us for making that online event, you know, still meaningful, still like with a bunch of, you know, like human connection and, and that kind of value that you try and I mean, obviously you can't replicate it totally, but how can no. you go way to like, you know, creating that human connection, but online? Yeah. You know, I, I was surprised, honestly, like I've been to, I've done many smaller events. This is the largest virtual event we've hosted. Um, and we're going to be doing more large scale virtual events. Um, and it felt, it felt, really good it almost felt like a real event um you know we had a central place to uh, organize the chat and conversation so there was like a single feed of people who could talk to each other um we did the speed networking thing uh, we used top in was a tool we ended up using um but you can do a lot of this with a lot of these tools um and i think like Look, like you're going to do an event and it's going to be pretty clear how to do your your first event in the in the big things, right? Like you're going to have speakers either giving talks or interviews on video and people are watching the video. Um, that's like one format. And then you have the format of the discussion group, 10, 12 people in a room. Um, you're going to have, you could do speed networking, one-to-one -one, people getting matched up. The formats are there. It's driven by the technology largely. Um, and it's good if you want a big event to kind of have these diversity of different experiences. So it's not just people watching, but different ways for them to interact. They can go and chat with vendors, um, letting them be involved and letting people interact with each other and use their voice, use their camera. That's really important for people to feel like they're part of the event rather than just watching the event. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's the little things, honestly, like little subtle things you can do to just make it more thoughtful and make it feel real. Um, we had uh, uh, an audience cheering track. So every time we introduce a speaker, we'd say like, hey, type in the comments in all caps, like what you think about this speaker, what you're excited about. So everyone's like typing in all caps in the writing and we play the audio track of the applause and the speakers actually came on. They're like, whoa, that was really cool. Like I actually feel like I see an audience there and people are interacting. Like that's part of the thing with virtual events. It's like, even right now, okay, like a bunch of people said, hello, good morning, hello. And then no one said anything else in the chat as far as I can see. So it's like, you're not seeing that feedback from attendees that you do in in uh, in like a real event. You're not seeing nodding heads, you're not seeing people smile. And so just creating more of that kind of interactive element is really valuable. Um, and then I think like those unique experiences we had in our event made it feel great as well, like having the midday yoga class. So people like were stretching together with the DJ at the end, we had a mixology class. So it wasn't all just professional content. It made it feel like a more kind of complete, well-rounded event. Mm, that's a good point. So as well as that, as well as like, you know, considering the audience uh, and the experience that they have through it, which is 
obviously the first thing that most people try and do. You're also trying to consider the experience that speakers have. We had a bit of trouble with that. I'm like, how can we make it? Like one of the great advantages of being a speaker at a conference is you get to meet the other speakers. Uh, you know, so what are we going to do to supplement <laughs> that you would be yeah. able to we actually had a green room for our event. So all the speakers, when they get to the event, they go to the green room and their like speaker, you know, manager was waiting there and they're like, welcome to the green room. Hang out here for a while. When you're ready, we're going to move into the main stage and they go to join the backstage of the main stage. And then until like they click participate, that's when they go onto the stage. So it almost felt like a real event that people were going through. Um, and actually it happened. Like I was in the green room with Anil Dash, who was one of our keynotes. And mm -hmm. and like another speaker joined and they started chatting with each other and the guy was like, Oh yeah, I've been following you forever. Really great to meet you. And then he was like, Great to meet you too. And he and the guy was uh, running community for Be My Eyes, um, which is all about accessibility and he's legally blind and and Anil is all about inclusivity and uh, ethical tech. And I was like, This is awesome, this is like a real event in the green room. Um, <laughs> oh, that's so, so good. That's yeah, so good. You can you can replicate some of these things. And how did the yoga go? Did people take part in that? Yeah. Yoga is awesome. Like there are literally people who are like, I've been wanting to try like stretching and yoga for years. And just because it was like added to this event that they were at, now they got to try it at home. Mm -hmm. And we did, um, the yoga is very focused on like sitting yoga. So you, all the moves for the most part you can do while sitting in your chair. And the idea was to like teach people things because we're all working from home. Uh, mm -hmm. That would help them like stretch and be more comfortable and, and take care of their body while working at home. So it felt very relevant. And yeah, people loved it. Like the comments ah. were all so positive. So good. So good. Well, good on you for thinking creatively about it. I think it's. Uh, I, I can't take creative for that. Yeah. Uh, my team, Anne Marie on the team and Beth on, on the CMX team, they, they ran the whole show and selected some really creative. Um, creative ideas. We had a calligraphy class and there's just lots of really creative concepts to make it feel like a very diverse event. Love it. Um, man, we've got 15 minutes left, so I want to, we've got a bunch of questions piling up. <laughs> really good ones. So I want to like get into some of those. Um, awesome. So one of these questions um, was about acquisition and the question was, it was from an anonymous person, so I'm sorry if you're if you're online and you wanted your name wrote out, but uh, they have a, a, a SaaS business and they're thinking about building a community for and using it for acquisition, customer acquisition. Yeah. What's like right. your best tip for getting started on something like that? Yeah, again, just, just get started. It doesn't have to be a massive forum. It doesn't have to be a massive event. Um, you can just start organizing you know, discussion groups for your customers, especially in B2B. Customers are dying to talk to each other. Um, there's great examples of this, like Ironclad is a really great one. They would run four different kinds of event types that were speaker-based or roundtable or workshop-based. All their customers are the in-house legal representatives at, at brands and companies. Um, mm. Branch has their mobile growth community, another great example. They're doing it, a lot, it all virtually now as well. Atlassian, Salesforce, like B2B is actually growing exponentially fast in terms of investing in community. To get started, just start bringing people together. If you want, You and, and a good way to think about it is asynchronous and synchronous. So asynchronous is going to be your Slack group, your forum, uh, message boards, anywhere where people can passively interact without having to be there at the same time. And you want to complement that with synchronous experiences. And mm -hmm. so organizing a discussion group, organizing an event, organizing spaces where people come together at the same time and they can actually interact with each other yeah okay so uh that's kind of so the next question which is very much related to this i'm just going to build on it was from uh, mike mcmin from my hub internet and he's like people are just really looking for like you know five-step plan like to get in and get started on building community but what you're saying is like you know those things are available you can go and you can do like cmx course for example and get the fundamentals of, of community but what you're saying is like it's best just to actually start something like and it can be anything it could be a meetup could be a facebook group whatever yeah i think so the the goal is just to get people your community isn't the technology your community is the people and the, and the conversations and the relationships that they're building the value they're creating for each other and so if you build a great community on slack and one day you decide like we need to move to a new platform yes that's going to be a logistical headache but your community will still exist those relationships will still exist and you'll be able to transfer it so don't over rotate on we need the perfect platform we need the perfect format or you're actually look at your community like a product and you're creating a community mvp um, you're creating mm -hmm. your most your minimum viable community 
um, and you're experimenting. You're saying, what's going to work for this group of people? And so you're getting, you're getting on the phone with them first, talking to them, asking mm. them, how can community serve them? What would you be interested in? Would you want to get on a discussion group that we organize every week with other peers that we curate and we guide discussions around the questions you have? Of course, they're going to say yes. Great. So they say yes, and then you try it, and you collect feedback after every single event you do, or every, um, or you continuously collect feedback from the members of your forum, and you figure out, cool, here's what's working, here's what's not. If it's not working, cut it or adapt it. If it's working, then start building that into your kind of rituals of your community. And so, great. Now, every week, we're going to do virtual office hours. That's mm -hmm. something that we just will consistently have. It worked. It went great. And we're going to start to scale that up. And mm -hmm. once you find that kernel, like the things that do work, um, then you you can that's the power of community. You can scale it up exponentially, especially when you start empowering your community members to self-organize, right? So you do it your first, uh, yourself first. Once you figure out how it works and it works well, then you can start saying like, hey, if you want to do this yourself, here's the format for running a discussion group or an event. Go ahead and run with it. And that's how you get to companies like Duolingo was running 2,600 events a month with a team of two people. And it was mm -hmm. all driven by empowering their community members to self-organize. Um, so that's a power. A month, 2,600 events a month with two people. This, uh, so this reminds me, is uh, actually something that uh, I heard uh, I worked through CMX, but uh, just pulling off what you're saying and, and looking at some of the questions here, a lot of people think when they're trying to start a community, they think about what their objectives are. So if you've got a SaaS business, you might want acquisition or it might be you're after customers to help each other learn how to use the product. But the thing to not forget is to like, you really got to focus on what the community wants. So mm -hmm. you ask yourself what you want, but then you need to find out what they want. Uh, yep. And you know where those two things meet, that's where you have community. 100%. Um, yeah, so, all right, they're great questions. Keep them coming in, guys, and keep them upvoting if you can. Um, so this next one is uh, around building a B2B community for uh, a brand. Is it is it better to build, like if you've got a B2C company, is it better to build a community around uh, your brand itself or more around the domain? So, for example, uh, you know, you might sell a health product. It could, be, it could be balding cream, you know. Do you start a community for the balding cream products or for people who are going yeah. bald? It's a great question. Um, and there isn't one right answer there. We've seen companies be really successful with both. I would say some general rules of thumb there are um, if you're super early and no one gives a crap about your product yet, then mm -hmm. it's probably better to focus on the general domain. Right. Mm. And so, you know, Branch, when they started, they built the mobile growth community really early on. They call it mobile growth. Like they don't call it the branch community, they call it the mobile growth community. And mm. it's all about mobile growth. Um, uh, Culture Amp, uh, an Australian company, also did that really well. Um, they, they started the people geek community. They didn't call it the culture amp community. They call it the people geek community. And they really want to build a community around the identity that their customers have. Um, now, if you have a great brand like Nike, right. Or Apple, you pro you have a lot more clout and, and reputation in your brand already. And so, yeah, there are people who are just going to be really, really passionate about your, your brand and your products. Then that starts to form kind of your user groups, your support forums, the, the people who are focused on that. Um, and ultimately, you can have both. Um, but um, yeah, it's really about, it's it's impossible to motivate people to care about something that they don't already care about. Um, mm. So what you want to do is figure out what do they care about already and and just pour your energy into supporting those people and bringing them together around what they care about. If they care about your product, then continue to pour energy into that and bring people together around your product and your brand. If they don't care about your product or your brand yet, but you know there's this larger kind of identity you can organize, then pour your energy into that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, got another question here from Sean at Time Chi. Hey, Sean, thanks for joining. Uh, now, I know you have experience with this, David. If you build a community on Facebook, how do you then take the community off Facebook but keep the same levels of engagement? Like I know this is something a lot of people struggle with. Yeah, you're going to take a hit in engagement. Uh, you will lose people in that transition, um, and that that's going to happen. Um, but the long, you have to think about it long term. Like you're going to get a short term hit in engagement, but long term, 
if you actually have a space that you are controlling and you own, then face the thing with Facebook is like, yeah, groups are highly engaging right now. We run a Facebook group with over 10,000 members. So like we, we, we're we taking this risk as well, um, but there's value in going to where people are. But Facebook can change their algorithm tomorrow and say groups no longer get you know listed high up in the feed. And now you've just lost the entire audience that you've built around your community. And so long term, you're going to have more ownership and your your users, your community members are going to develop new habits of coming to your space rather than going to Facebook, and then once they're on Facebook, then they are like, oh yeah, I should check on that Facebook group that's in there. Um, you're relying on Facebook as a distribution channel instead of developing your own distribution channels. So long-term, it's always gonna be better to own your community experience and your community data as well, because you're not getting shit for data from Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in summary, like if you already have a, a group on Facebook uh, and you want to keep investing in that long term, you should probably start thinking about transitioning off if you want to, you know, long term maintain a bit of security and stability in that group and you want to have a bit of assurance that you'll that you'll own it. Uh, but you are going to take a hit on engagement. There's just nothing you can do about it. Yeah. I, and, and keep doing the Facebook group. We still are. But like be clear on the purpose of that group. Mm -hmm. And so we know that. We don't own that group. At the end of the day, Facebook owns that group. We may have the relationships, but they own the, the space itself. And so we're constantly trying to, we use that as a space because it's highly engaging and people find us through that. We use that as kind of more like top of the funnel in a way. And we're constantly trying to drive people to our events, to our email newsletter, to our other community spaces that we own um, in order to bring them into spaces that we can have more control over how we engage with them in that relationship. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, Sean, for that question. Uh, so next question, and this is related to your work at Bevy. If you want to build like a, like a global community, um, lots of people, you know, it's quite, it's easier to build a, a local community. Um, you can get people together in person, but what advice do you have for people who want to build global communities like right from the start? Yeah. So, um, so going back to my answer before, it really becomes the only way ultimately to scale any community is to distribute autonomy to your members, to create leaders within the network, right? Like that's how it's worked for the, since the beginning of humanity. That's why our government forms form the way it has. Uh, that's why elections run the way they do. That's why religions work the way they do, right? It's not you know, the Pope organizing everything. The Pope is, you know, way, way, way up there at the top. And now you have people at every single local level, on a regional level, on a, on a town level, on a church level, even within a church, there are subgroups and people who are contributing and leaders. And so that's what you want to do. You want to find the people who are really passionate about what you're doing, who want to contribute, and you give them the tools and the guides that they need to be successful. And so for CMX, we, we have 60 chapters around the world. Those are all volunteer run. The people apply to become a chapter leader. Once they're approved and we know they're a good fit, they get a full playbook onboarding. They get access to our chapter leader community. Um, we provide them with resources. They get lots of benefits for being part of the CMX community, free tickets to our events and trainings and things like that. And, and that's how you scale it. That's how Duolingo got to 25, 2600 events. That's how Salesforce has a thousand trailblazer chapters. Um, mm -hmm. And even online, if you look at forums, you don't, you're not gonna be able to manage everything. You're, not, you're definitely not gonna be able to answer all the questions. So it's about empowering the experts in that community to answer the questions and, and creating these roles within the community so that you're creating the formula and then you're just replicating that formula through the power of the leaders in your community. Great, awesome answer. I want, this is one other really good question. I wanna to get to it uh, before we go. We've got one more minute left. Um, what are your thoughts on community first or product or company first? Yeah, <laughs> I just asked this question to Anil Dash uh, yesterday in the keynote. Um, I, it's not, it's, it's a delicate balance and it's not either or, it's both. I think the days of companies being able to just be transactional and company first and not have to think about the humans that are consuming their product, right? To be community driven is essentially to be human driven. All you're saying is we care about these people, we wanna support them and community turns out is a really valuable way of supporting them because again, you can create that value at incredible scale. And so 
you know, when, when we look at any program we're doing, it kind of has dual objectives. One objective is how is this helping us build a healthy, engaged, happy community? And the other objective is how is this resulting in a business outcome, whether that's growth, retention, contribution, engagement, you know, the space model, you can look up the CMX space model and figure out the business value. And you want those two things to be aligned, right? To your point before, it's like a Venn diagram, like the community value, the business value, those should be aligned. So if you're doing something that's great for your business, but it's coming at the expense of your community, or it's not giving anything to your community, you're you're emptying that cup, that cup of trust. You can do that sometimes, right? The Gary V jab, 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 right hook, like give, 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 and then make an ask. Um, and if you're doing something that's just good for your community, but you're not actually able to tie that back to business outcomes, over the long run, you are gonna struggle as a community team to get the budget and resources that you need in order to properly build that community, grow in your career, grow your your roles as community builders and, and success, be successful in your work. And so you have to do both. You have to have a focus on the business outcome and have a focus on that community outcome. Amazing. Thank you so much. We're out of time, but this is incredible. That was really quick. Time, David. And we thank you all, all day. Yeah, well, I feel like we could. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining in on the chat. Alicia, Peter, Sean, Joris. There's heaps of them. So thank you, everyone who got engaged and asked questions. I hope we dealt with a, with with many of the things that you wanted answered. Uh, David, you're off now to the Startmate Q&A. So I'll get you, you can sign off and jump on the other link. To everybody else, again, thank you so much. Remember, we've got uh, another giant session coming up this morning and one on a uh, couple on tomorrow as well too. So uh, be sure to sign up for those. And thank you very much. I, I posted my email in there too. So hit me up with questions. Brave, thank you. <laughs>